I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorham, Maine. This is a nice uh, oak drop leaf table. Uh, it's made out of quarter sawn oak. I don't know how old it is, I can't tell. Uh, they've been making tables like this for three, four hundred years, so it gets kind of hard to tell sometimes. You can see it's a good sized table like six feet by five feet long. It's got nice pad feet. It's got this nice uh, bead detail on the tops of the legs. Uh, one of the main things that was wrong with it is that these hinges on this leaf, the hinges have come loose, so we've got to repair that. And also, the, the top just doesn't look good. It's got lots of marks and rings. There's a lighter area in the top, probably from damage. I've probably got to refinish this top too. Maybe we'll find some clues on the underside of the table here. You can see right away that the hinges have been replaced, so that doesn't really tell us too much. There's a number of these pieces of metal across the cracks on both leaves. Certainly, those pieces of metal look very old. There's lots of glue blocks around the inside of the apron. Some of them look old, some newer. Lots of other repairs. There's just a piece of wood going across this crack in the top. This hinge arrangement on the swing leg. You know, it's a wooden hinge. I don't know if that provides any information on age or not. I've certainly seen wooden hinges like this on late uh, 18th century tables, but I don't know the history of that. Yeah, here's the hinge that was loose. The other one's down there. <clears throat> you can see that the it was plugged, the new screws were put in, but those plugs pulled out, so I've got to do a better job. I just realized the hinges on this leaf, these hinges appear to be the same hinges that are on the other side, but they look original. This has not been cut out for a bigger hinge. Also, there's no screws from underneath uh, connecting the top to the base. Uh, possibly it's nailed from the top, and that would be another indication of being an old table. The legs are mortise and tenon. You can see these scribe marks from when they cut the tenon. This brace in the middle is also mortise and tenon. It looks like it has two tenons that are wedged. And none of that really tells us much about the age of the table. But it does tell us that it's handmade. So I want to check for any uh, repair work that needs to be done. Yeah, I had noticed this one before. These tops have a lot of cracks in them, joints coming apart, but uh, most have been repaired before. Yeah, this center section's got a crack down the middle. But I am not going to take this apart. It's got, uh, it's, this top is nailed down to the frame. It's got two nails right here. Uh, it's got a brace underneath in the middle. 
doesn't seem to be moving at this end. I'll just work some glue in here, clamp it, and then uh, maybe put an additional piece of wood across the bottom. Yeah, you, you can see it. There's a dowel in there. I think maybe you can see that dowel in there. <laughs> Here are the pencil lines, the marks that the person used for their doweling jig. There's a dowel in there. Uh, here's the, another mark, so you know a dowel is there. This end is tight. Now, I see movement. I'm going to wedge this open starting at this end. I may not take it all the way off. I'll start with some wedges at this end and just kind of see what happens. It's, uh, I don't know, I think maybe I should try to force this more open.
That looks uh, tight. I got squeezed out, and uh, you know it's fairly level. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll leave these clamps on overnight. Okay, I'm going to strip these tops using a conventional varnish remover. This is the kind that has uh, methylene chloride in it. And this is uh, what I do to prepare. It's only in the 30s outside today, so earlier I turned up the heat to 70, put it on hold. Turned on all my electric heaters. I put one heater aiming directly at the stripper cans here to heat it up to 70 degrees if I can, or at least as much as possible. Stripper fumes are heavier than air, so I'll crack the big door down here at the bottom and turn on the fan.
Okay, I'm going to let these set for 20 or 30 minutes. Okay, let's try uh, scraping it. Yeah, this looks like it's coming up pretty clean. Let me uh, try a piece of steel wool. Yeah, that's coming nice and clean. And so now I'll do the two leaves the same way. Okay, I've let these dry overnight and uh, they look really good. Uh, except for these spots, which I hope are watermarks. Uh, this is a burn, so it's not coming out of there. So I want to treat these with oxalic acid, see if that will take care of these marks. Um, and you can't just treat that area, I have to treat the whole tabletop. I'm going to sand it lightly with 220 first, um, just to help prepare the surface a little bit for the treatment. Just cleaning off the surface a little bit here. I'm going to mix four tablespoons of uh, oxalic acid in a quart of hot water. That black square mark is gone. This mark is already lightened up considerably. I hope it keeps going. just for a little while, you know, 15 or 20 minutes or so, I'll go back and hit these areas that are dry. And especially I'll put a little bit more where that mark is. Now, I want to show you something. This is the water laying on the surface. You see how it's not flowing out. That's going to be a problem. We'll talk about that later. Okay, you can see that the oxalic is dried. You can see all the oxalic crystals. Uh, that one black mark went away completely. This round mark uh, 
uh, really improved a lot, but it's still there. This is the point at which these exolic uh, crystals can become dangerous if they become airborne, so it's important to thoroughly rinse all this away. I'm also mopping the floor up in here because exolic spilled on the floor. I know someone's going to walk in here with no shoes on and then lick their feet, and I'm not mentioning any names, but... Okay, they've dried for a few hours. I'm going to sand them again with 220 again and uh, give them another treatment, maybe a little stronger. I'd like to see this ring go out. This sandpaper is really gumming up a lot more than yesterday. I'm going to wipe this down with some lacquer thinner, see if we can pull some of this oil out of here. So the lacquer thinner dried, I switched to free cut paper and uh, it's sanding up a lot better. Okay, another coat of oxalic acid, just like the last one. Okay, I've let that dry overnight. Um, you know, this coat was twice as strong as the last coat of oxalic acid. And you can see that, you know, all the dried crystals on top. So now I'll take this outside and rinse it off just like last time. Okay, I've let these dry actually for a couple of days, and so uh, I'm ready to take the next step, which will be staining. The uh, second coat of oxalic acid, although it was stronger, I mean, it, it helped more with this circle. It's not gone completely, but to do anything else would involve a lot of sanding, and I'm just not going to sand this top with anything other than a 220. But I remembered uh, I still have to fix the screw holes in these leaves for the hinges. I'll do that before I do anything else. Yeah, it's easy to see that these need to be repaired. And this wood in here uh, almost appears to be rotted. Uh, it's already gone through the top. I may need to go with a patch all the way through to the top. I'm going to add a little uh, support under here with some clamps uh, because I'm probably going to go through to the top there so I want this well supported I seem to be getting down to some white wood before going through. That's what I want to see, white wood. All this blackness seems so strange. It seems like this table was just soaked down in oil, top and bottom, everywhere. I don't know if it was raw linseed oil. It, it seems like almost like motor oil, although I don't detect any smell.
Okay, identical routine for this repair. Just like the last one, before I ever could get that bottom flat, I'd be through the top. So that's why I mixed hide glue with the sawdust, layered the bottom, and then used you know unthickened hide glue for everything else. I'm relying on the side joints here. Okay, there's a few screw holes like these that need to be plugged. People use a lot of things to fill screw holes. They'll use uh, just glue, uh, toothpicks, matchsticks, uh, glue and toothpicks, dowels and plugs. And uh, we all know what uh, dowels are, but in this case we're asking these three-quarter inch screws to hold a lot of weight on these leaves which are even moving at times and so I want to use plugs and I want to sort of demonstrate the difference between a dowel and a plug what happens when you screw into a dowel Now let's have a look. So you can see it looks good. The threads of the screw cut into the wood really well. But remember with a dowel the grain runs lengthwise. So the screw threads are cutting away the very thing that gives the wood the strength. The wood doesn't seem very strong, does it? So practically speaking, dowels can work well for doing most screw holes, but I want maximum strength on these leaves, so I want to use a plug. What's a plug? Well, the plug is cut from a piece of wood, and it's cut this way. In other words, the grain's running across the plug. I think it'll be helpful if I show how plugs are made. You select the proper size plug cutter for the job you're doing. Let's try a half inch just for a demonstration. So a plug is you know, fundamentally different than a dowel in that the grain runs perpendicular to the grain in a dowel. Let's see what happens. Instead of drilling into the plug though, I'll drill into this board. Remember, this is where the plug came from, right there. So here you go, it looks a lot like the dowel. The threads cut really well into the wood. But there's a big difference between this and the dowel. Remember that the strength of wood runs with its grain. These threads have cut, you know, with the grain. In the dowel, the threads have sheared off the end grain, which is just cannot be as strong as this.
couple of nails in there. At first I thought these hinges had been replaced. Now I think that the hinges were moved because the hinges on the other side have not been moved and they look like the same hinges. I've kept the screws in order so each screw will go back into the hole I took it out of. As I tighten these I'm constantly aware of the top here. I don't want anything poking through the top. That needs to be drilled. Drilling into tops is never fun. And this is one of our plugs. Huh. Oh, interesting. There's a couple of dowels that somebody used. I think a lot of the problem here was that the screws they used were too short. These are half inch. I'll go with three quarters. These are old three-quarter tens. Here's one that's already sawed off a bit. This is mine compared to the one that came out of there. This top is just three-quarter of an inch thick, yet uh, I'm putting three-quarter inch screws in it. We need maximum holding power for these big leaves. So how does that work? I've set my tape at five-eighths. My screw is a full three-quarter inch long. I'm kept constantly checking underneath. I don't want anything poking through. Now I stop short just by a little bit there and then back it out. Well, the leaves uh, work great in this position. I really need to get it on its feet and make sure they work correctly. Uh, before I do that, uh, looks like a little mildew in here. I'm going to clean with some vinegar.
And then I'm going to clean these legs. Uh, and I think I'm going to use Murphy's oil soap. This finish is so oily, I'm going to stick with that and use the Murphy's. great when it's wet. It's uh, brighter and redder. Didn't really take much off of these. Uh, now I want to wax one, see what that looks like. I'm doing just that area for now. I'm just trying to see what the color is. All right, I've let this dry for about a half an hour or so. I need to take a mental snapshot of this color. Well, the leaves work great. Uh, they're nice and sturdy, line up. The seam between the leaf and the top is as good as it can be on an antique table. It's not bad at all. So now I'll take these leaves off. And uh, don't worry, I'm going to flip it over on the floor here like I did in the beginning. And then we'll uh, see if we can come up with a stain. It's interesting looking at the colors here on the base with the table upside down. How light it is here and how it fades into the darker leg. And uh, that's what I'm going to remember when I'm doing the stain on the top. Alright, here's the leg that I waxed up. And of course, looking at this table, you know, it's very, very red. It's also very brown. And um, I have a can of stain called Red Brown Mahogany. Let's, um, I think I'll try that. Try, try a little bit larger area. Boy, that looks that looks really good. Well, I lucked out with this one because a can of stain right off the shelf uh, looks really good. So I'll stain everything with that, and then we'll seal it. And then, if we need to adjust the color, we'll you know, address that issue then. So I'm just <clears throat> going over all the surfaces one more time before staining, just with the 150, checking for anything. And uh, the, the oil just keeps coming up, no matter, despite all my efforts <clears throat> to draw the oil out and get rid of it. I can only guess that this finish was like raw linseed oil, even though it seems more like <laughs> motor oil. 
somebody must have dumped a boatload of it on this tabletop, and it never dries, never comes up. And that brings up a subject of uh, a lot of people may thinking, maybe thinking, geez, I, you shouldn't refinish antiques. And generally speaking, that's true, and it's a good rule of thumb. But here we have a dining room table. It's clearly not the original finish. This table's been worked over <clears throat> numerous times, many, many repairs. But the bottom line is this table's being used as a dining room table. And the finish that was on here did not work. It didn't look well. It didn't function well. And so we're, my goal is to get a durable finish on this. I'm not, you know, belt sanding the top or anything. In fact, I'm not even sanding it hardly at all. And that will cause problems later, and I'm going to have to deal with those problems. But I want to keep all these marks, all the scars, everything. Okay, the stain is dried overnight. I'm going to put down the first coat of finish. I'm using uh, this tongue oil varnish. I'm putting on as thin a coat as I can. I'm really going to spread it out. I'm worried about uh, contamination of this wood. So I don't want a, a film thickness thick enough that it can distort. We'll see what happens. Well, these have dried overnight really well. I've had to have the heat cranking. And uh, so now, today, I'm just going to flip these leaves over and put a coat on the other side. I put another coat on the bottoms of the leaves off camera. And so now, another coat for the top of the top. And of course I put on that one really thin coat, it soaked in a lot. I'm going to put on another coat now, hopefully it will go down a little bit uh, heavier without any reaction. A few drips from when I was doing the other side. I can't sand them because I'll, there's hardly any finish on here, I sand through the stain but I can kind of slice them off here. That's one of those plugs from the other side. I need to put a little dye stain on it.
So I've let the finish dry for a couple of days. It's been cold weather. <clears throat> I've kept the heat up, but still extra day doesn't hurt. Um, I've got a great color here, good red background. But uh, if you look at my leg sample here, <clears throat> I need more brown. So I think I'm going to uh, glaze it. But first, I've got to sand it. I'm using 320 here. And even though the finish seems really dry to the touch, it feels a little bit gummy as I sand it, it's even with an extra day of drying. So I'm sanding as well as I can until the sandpaper just uh, absolutely uh, gives it up. I'm trying to smooth off all the nits. And, uh, and then when I've done as much as I can with the sandpaper, I'm taking a 3M pad and just kind of finishing it off, taking the gloss off. Those are the tips of screws. The screws, uh, some of the screws holding those big crude metal plates on underneath. Well, I've done the whole tabletop. It took about two and a half hours to do that because of the softness of the finish. So I think I'm going to let it dry, keep the heat up, let it dry overnight. All right, I've let it dry in an additional 24 hours. It, it seems great. And now I'm going to glaze the top. Uh, glaze is a uh, medium. Uh, you can get it at any art store. Uh, think of it as like a uh, stain but with no color in it. So you get your glaze coat and I'm going to use uh, asphaltum as a colorant. And uh, asphaltum is uh, exactly what it sounds like. I'll use two brushes. One to apply the glaze and one to sort of feather it out if I need it. I think it could use a little more color. Okay, this has a little bit more of the asphaltum color in it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's getting there. I've got my glaze uh, smoothed out pretty evenly here. Now I'm going to go back and put a little on the outside edges, a little bit more glaze. All right, I'm going to do the leaves the same process and let everything dry overnight. Well, I've let this dry for uh, 
uh, two days or over two nights actually. Now the glaze, uh, especially the asphaltum glaze, kind of never wants to dry. It's still tacky. So I'm going to lay on a, um, another coat of gloss and I've got to move quickly. I don't want the varnish to pull the glaze up. So I won't be, you know, when I'm putting on coach before, you see me constantly tipping off the finish, trying to make it all even. This time I put it on quickly and uh, try not to pull any glaze. These tops are nice and dry. I let this dry over the weekend. I kept the heat up. I think the top only needs one more coat. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do though is put a final coat on the bottom of the leaves. I'm just going to uh, sand them quickly with 220. Just looking for any uh, major nits or, or drips along the edges or anything like that. I take uh, special care along the rule joint though. I don't want uh, a buildup of finish or anything else in this joint. This is the same finish, it's just satin version. Well, the bottoms of these leaves have dried really well. They look good. And uh, so now I can sand the top and uh, put another coat on it. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be the final coat or not. Depends on how this sands up. The finish uh, has got a lot of uh, crap in it. It's going to be a tough sanding job. The asphaltum glaze I put on top uh, never really dry, so I had this sitting around for three days, so it picked up a lot of dust and debris and stuff. And then, of course, the finish itself is a slow drying finish. So there's areas where there's a lot of stuff here, and it's just going to take careful sanding. I'm going to start sanding with a 320, and then follow up with a uh, ultra fine Scotch Brite pad. You can see right away it's picking up oily residue from that glaze. So once I've uh, sanded it as much as I can, there, it's not, not too bad, but then I'll go over it with a gray pad and that should really uh, smooth it out and get rid of the <coughs> very final little bumps and stuff. Basically I want all these, you know, shiny areas to go away, to dull down. Alright, looks like I got a good procedure here. Now I just have to do the whole top like this. It'll take a little while. So that took about two hours to smooth these down. You know, because of the, uh, the late hour and because of all the stuff I was getting off the top, it still wasn't completely dry. I'm going to wipe this down with uh, uh, paint thinner and let it dry overnight, keep the heat up. All right, the top's dried overnight. But before I apply another coat, I want to fill in uh, some of these big nail holes. And I also want to touch up uh, some high points that were sanded through. 
I didn't fill in these nail holes previously uh, when the table was stripped because I didn't want to sand these areas and make them lighter. So I'll fill them in now with the uh, low heat burn-in sticks. I didn't do like every defect, I just did the worst offending uh, nail holes. I want to keep the defects. Now next, I need to touch up uh, any sand throughs. Because I didn't sand the table flat, uh, there's high points. And I knew this would happen as I sanded. I've, uh, I've uh, sanded through a few of those high points, so I need to stain those areas. And I just have to be really careful every step of the way. I'm using a Van Dyke Brown dye stain. You know, most of the sand throughs occur around these big uh, old breaks and stuff, so it'll be easy for me to re uh, hopefully remember where they are because I have to be really careful of these spots going forward. Okay, uh, now I'm ready to put on another coat. This next coat will be satin. I'm not sure if it's going to be the final coat. It might be, so I want to use satin. The top has a, a beautiful red background in the color. That stain worked out well. I'm worried that it's a little too red. I'm going to add some green dye stain to this coat and try to uh, knock the red down just a little bit. This dye stain is soluble in uh, lacquer thinner and uh, alcohol, acetone, things like that, but I'm going to see if I can mix it up a little bit with some paint thinner because that's what I can pour into the uh, varnish. It's funny how the stain looks blue in here instead of uh, <laughs> the green. I don't know what that's about. Now it looks green. Oh yeah, that, that, that's very, very light. Maybe that's all I want. Yeah, this is great. I've left this dry for a couple days. It's dried really well. No more of that little stickiness I was finding here and there from the glaze. Uh, but it still needs another coat. Uh, I hope you can see this. I'll try to get a shot of it. The coat looks good. It's nice and smooth. But it's not even. It definitely needs more. another coat of finish. At least one more coat of finish. 
So I'm going over it uh, just really lightly with some 500 grit gold paper, and then I'll go over it uh, once again just lightly though with a uh, Scotch Brite pad. I don't I don't want to be cutting through any of the high spots uh, like I did in the previous sanding. These uh, Scotch-Brite pads are uh, saving the day here because it doesn't really want to sand well at all. It's funny, it feels dry to the touch, <clears throat> but the sandpaper wants to clog up. And these are doing a great job. All right, I've got the top all smoothed out, <clears throat> ready for another coat. Uh, but because of the way it, it clogged up so much on the sandpaper, uh, I'm going to let it dry overnight. Alright, I've let it dry overnight, kept the heat up. It's all ready. I'm going to just go over the edges. I mean, I'm going to look over the edges to see if there's anything I want to hit uh, with a marker, any light spots. Okay, I'll uh, keep the heat cranking all day. We'll see what it looks like tomorrow. Well, the table's looking really good. Um, this coat went down great. Uh, hardly has any stuff in the surface. I kept the shop really quiet while it was drying. But it does need one more coat. And I don't know if I can, I'm going to try to show this the camera, I don't know if I can see it, but from a distance at an angle, I can see the finish just looks a little bit starved in places. I think it just needs one more coat. So I've let this dry uh, another day, and so now I'll put a, uh, another coat on it, which I think will be the final coat. You don't need to sand between coats for this finish, which is nice, but I will go over this just with the Scotch Bite gray pad, uh, just to there's, it's not completely smooth, there's little nits in it here and there, very little, but I'll go over it with this just to smooth it out. What's nice about uh, the gray pads, the scotch Bright pads, you know this top is not flat, I didn't sand it flat, it's got high spots, low spots, it's uneven, and this pad, much more than sandpaper, sandpaper has a tendency to cut through those high spots, this will kind of ride over them a little bit better. You could cut through with this, but it's much easier to avoid cutting through those high spots. Boy, after going over this surface, I mean, it looks so good. I could wax it and call it a day, but I know that it needs, I know that it has areas that need more finish, so you just can't see them after I go over it with the pad. All right. I'm going to wipe these down with some uh, a, a rag with some paint thinner on it and then apply the final coat.
Yeah, I've let this table dry for two days, and uh, it's really dried nice. This, this last coat went down great. The table's got a nice kind of texture to it. I hope you can see that. I'll try to show you. And so now I'm just going to give it a kind of an easy rub out. So by light rub out, I mean I'm not going to sand it or anything. Uh, I'm going to take 4 aught steel wool. Uh, this Liberon steel wool it comes like this is what you want to use uh, on tabletops. And then with a very flat hand, in other words I'm not going to go with my fingers, keeping my hand flat, I'm going to start going over this, trying to even it out a little bit. I mean there's, it's really hard to see but there's differences, little variances in sheen and whatnot, and I think that this will help even it out and help bring out the texture. I'm not pressing down with much force, just just lightly. Now you come across something like this, a little piece of something in the finish. Take my trusty razor blade. I don't go with one finger at that spot. You got to do the top evenly. You can still see it a little bit because it has some dust in it of finish, uh, but it'll go. It feels perfectly smooth, and, and uh, when I wax it, it'll go away. It might be hard to see, but throughout this top, there's little dull spots, little circular, dull spots, almost like the finish was trying to fisheye but couldn't do it. Luckily, though, just by going evenly slowly, evenly, not much pressure. The shine comes up a bit and the spots seem to be gone. I do one section at a time, typically like one-fourth of the object and then uh, when I do this half, I'll do that half and I'll go long ways over them, counting how many times I go back and forth, making sure I do everything the same and making sure I overlap the section so it all comes out as even as possible. Alright, this looks good and it feels good too. I'm going to try putting these two halves side by side and see if I can uh, get a shot that shows the difference. Yeah, I'm hoping that you can see that this side has more clarity now and plus uh, also all that work by hand brings out the texture. It's not so it has more of a sheen. At the same token, this is this looks too uniform and too even. Now it looks the way they want it to look. So what I'm doing is looking at the raking light coming in and how it reflects on the top. And the steel wool is changing that reflection and here I'm looking and I'm just going until I make sure it's even, all the, that there's no more shiny spots or no more of these little defects around here. And it's a nice even shine. <clears throat> The razor blade gets rid of little nits, but what you're really looking for are these. You can see there's a little bit of uh, dust trapped in that crater, but the wax will take care of that too. I want, to, uh, I want to wax the legs at this point. I'll clean them with this uh, commercial cleaner. And I'm using this uh, uh, 
brown bee wax really to use as a uh, sort of a scratch cover so it might cover little uh, scars like that. This leaf goes on the other side. That's more like it. Now I'm going to go over the top uh, just uh, gently and easily with some 4 aught steel wool and my favorite uh, beeswax and orange oil polish. The dry steel wool leaves a little bit of a haze and this waxing takes that off and uh, uh, really improves the clarity. There you go. This is a nice Queen Anne dining table, probably over 300 years old. If you remember when it came in here, the screws had pulled out, so the leaves were hanging off. Uh, the leaves, one of the leaves was cracked. And also the finish was no good. It was a, a kind of a black, oily, sticky mess. So we refinished the top. Now, what about the people who say that if you refinish an antique, you lose its value? I believe they're referring to the current market value, and I know nothing about that. That's an, another business entirely. It has nothing to do with furniture repair. And it doesn't really matter unless you're actively selling your antique furniture. Most of us find value in the practicality of our furniture, and then it's used as a decorative object, in other words, how it looks. This table, when it was built over 300 years ago, was built as a dining room table and it was used as a dining room table. In fact, it looks like it's been in continuous use, and it was in rough shape when it came in here. It's been repaired and refinished many times. I'm not the first person nor the last that's going to refinish this tabletop. And now it's, it can be used as a table. And what I did was, you know, remove the old finish chemically. I sanded the top very little, just enough to sort of prepare it for the ensuing finish. I've uh, never sanded it with a machine. I love how it's all still textured. This is a good old-fashioned finish. They've been making this finish the same way since 1912, so I like it, and it really uh, seriously mellows out over time and looks great. All of uh, life's mile markers, all the war wounds, everything, still here. I think it looks pretty good.